going to be in Judges chapter 13, uh, verse 2 through 14, verse 7 today. Um, and actually, you know, as we get started into this uh, message this morning, I, I recognize that a lot of times we hold secrets, don't we, from people. We are involved in things maybe we shouldn't be, or we're at places where maybe we shouldn't go, and, and so we just hold these secrets. In fact, 20-year-old uh, Justin Bieber had a tough year uh, so far. Um, he was arrested for underage drinking and driving DUI and drag racing back in January, and more recently, his racist remarks were leaked out uh, from this video that he had done when he was 15 years old, and uh, he uses the N-word and an ill-conceived joke, and so now he's very sorry for that and, and apologetic. In fact, he says he's very sorry and that it was childish and it was inexcusable, right? He has, however, uh, shown some signs of wanting to clean up his act. Apparently, uh, at the beginning of June, after some intense Bible study, he was baptized at the Hillsong New York City Church. And uh, he's been posting scripture verses on his Instagram account, according to the news. Now, some are questioning his integrity about that. They think it's maybe a show, but who knows? Could it be possible that, that he is sincere about turning his life around? Or, you know, it's not just celebrities that have secrets in their background. Think about government officials. You know, what about this big fiasco going around, uh, going on with the, with the Veterans Administration over these 1,700 cases of veterans who needed medical care in just Phoenix alone? And, but they were intentionally kept off the waiting lists, and according to an Inspector General's report, there was a big cover-up in the VA hospitals uh, where they tried to make themselves look better than they were. And it is believed, in fact, that some people who needed medical care and needed medical attention died before they could see, uh, be seen by some of these VA doctors. Well, just before former Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Eric Shinseki, resigned, he said, recent weeks have been very challenging, but the VA takes caring for veterans seriously. Now, of course, you know, people are challenging that statement. There's been this history of covering up their misdeeds for a number of years and, and veterans waiting to see doctors. But, you know, the Veterans Administration, they're, they're being accused of, of lying and, and hiding their past. Well, I suppose it's easy for us to pick on celebrities. It's easy for us to pick on the government for their embarrassing shortcomings and and their secrets but you know if we're really honest with ourselves we realize that it's not just them that struggle with truth and integrity we all do don't we uh, i came across a 2004 story from the online news source called the onion and they reported about some research that was done by a california berkeley professor who headed up this 10-year study looking at the private lives of Americans. And he was doing this study, and Dr. Maya Green discovered that it's not just the famous who are participating in shady business deals and substance abuse and peculiar sexual activities. In fact, Dr. Green concluded that 100% of Americans, 100%, that would be everybody in this room, engage in strange and obsessive behavior that if revealed, he says, would humiliate them. Everyone has secrets, don't they? Well, meet Samson. Samson had enough skeletons to fill two closets. He had enough dirty linen, probably to keep a laundromat open 24 hours a day. He should have been a godly man, but he wasn't. And yet in, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter of the Bible, it mentions him as a man of faith. Well, Samson is worth studying, I think, because he is so much like us, believe it or not. Sometimes we think of the stories of men like Abraham and Moses and, and David, and, and we kind of put them in a different league, don't they? We attach labels to them like exceptional men, where we see ourselves as just regular people. But this isn't the case with Samson. He is a lot like us, and many of us know what it's like, for instance, to come from a home where God is minimally acknowledged, but maybe not followed too closely. And many of us, 
you know, have entered life with great opportunities and are maybe people have placed great expectations on us and we just maybe let them down. You know, most men know what it means to be tempted by women. And most of us probably know what it means to struggle with wanting to get revenge on someone who hurt us. And when we see Samson struggling and falling, we've all been there, we know exactly what he's going through. So the question is, you know, where did Samson go wrong? He had so much going for him. Why did he waste his life when he could have done better? And we're looking for clues and answers in the Bible's book of Judges, chapters 13 through 16. In these chapters, it unfolds the story of how a man who had it all just kind of let it get away from him. And today, more specifically, we are going to see what happens when truth and integrity go missing from your life. And what can you do about that? You've probably heard the statement before, it doesn't matter what you do in public just as long as you do your job well. Have you ever heard that statement? Usually we hear that when some public official cheats on his wife, you know, and he has an affair and then he's, then he's caught. Well, Monica Lewinsky, she's back in the news again. She just recently came out with a tell-all book. Did any of you go out and buy that? <laughs> I didn't either. But uh, she, tell, she wrote this book, and she talks about this fling she had with President Clinton in the White House back in the 90s. And, you know, I remember that as he was going through his impeachment proceedings, the media would try to downplay the significance of the affair by interviewing people who would say over and over again, well, it doesn't matter, you know, what a person does in public just as long as it doesn't affect his work in office. And I, and I can remember scratching my head at one point thinking, hmm, this whole affair happened at the office where he was supposed to be doing his work, but he was doing something different. So can I just say something here? What you do in private matters because it reveals the true you. Integrity and honesty do matter in your life. And one of the things that I observed with Samson is that Samson's secret sins kind of paved the way for his public failure. Here's a man who was of incredible physical strength, and even though he tried to hide his personal and spiritual weaknesses, they still showed up and he failed to follow the demands of the Nazarite vow he had taken, which involved him dedicating his life to God, to lead the people and to free them from oppression by these very real enemies. And so in Judges chapter 14, verses 5 through 7, we read this. It says, Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother, and as they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring towards him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. <clears throat> then he went down and he talked with the woman and he liked her. Now, let me just ask you, <laughs> if you were attacked by a lion, and you tore this thing apart with your bare hands and your life was spared, would you just keep that story to yourself? Or would you be like me and you'd go out to your friends and your neighbors and your family and you'd be going, guess what I just did? You know, right? I mean, this incredible thing happens and Samson doesn't tell anybody, not even his own family. This, this is an incredible thing here. You don't keep that kind of a story to yourself. You brag about it. So why is Samson so hush-hush here? Well, verse 5 says, Samson went down to Timnah. Timnah was a Philistine territory. It was about four miles away from Samson's village of Zorah. And to get there, you had to walk down a ridge into the Sorek River Valley and up the other side. And so very literally, it is true that, that Samson went down to Timnah. But I think the Bible's revealing something else here as well about Samson, more particularly in relation to his spiritual decline. Because look at what he's doing. He leaves the land of the Israelites to go to the land of the Philistines. To put it more bluntly, Samson leads his friends to go and mess around with the enemies. 
And if he was looking for a wife, he shouldn't have been looking in the land of the Philistines for a wife. He shouldn't have been there at all. And by going down to Timnah, Samson is indeed going down. Well, so while Samson and his parents make their way down to Timnah, Samson turns aside. Okay, and he, he goes into this vineyard where he encounters this attacking lion. Now, one of the questions that I wonder about is why is Samson a Nazarite in a vineyard? What do they do in vineyards? They make wine. And, uh, you know, in the book of, Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 6, it is very clear that a Nazarite was not to drink wine or any kind of intoxicating beverage. So I'm just kind of putting two and two together here. And my hunch is that the reason why Samson couldn't talk about this great feat that just took place with the lion is because he was breaking his Nazarite vow to abstain from wine, from alcohol. He was partying heartily. And he couldn't talk about the lion he defeated with his bare hands because he was in a place he shouldn't have been doing something that he shouldn't have done. It's kind of similar to the situation a minister found himself in one Sunday when he woke up. It was Sunday. And it was a beautiful summer morning. I mean, the, the humidity was low, the temperature was 71, the sun is shining, the birds are chirping. And he was an avid golfer. He really wanted to be out on the golf course that morning. But of course, he had church to lead. You know, he had a sermon to preach and lessons to teach. And nonetheless, he called the chairman of the board and he said he was sick. And as he, as he talked, he, he put on a hoarse voice, you know, <laughs> I'm not feeling too well today, and threw in a cough <coughs> every now and then. And, and uh, you know, the chairman of the board said he'd get things covered. And after he hung up the phone, the minister secretly heads off to the golf course, right? So he's working his way through his round, and he gets to the first par three. And he's up at there at the tee box, and he hits the ball, and he gets a, a hole in one. Now, he is thrilled about this hole-in-one. He's never gotten a hole-in-one before. He can't wait to get back home and tell all his friends and tell his church and tell his family what just happened. You know, this was an amazing thing that took place. He wants to brag. The only thing is, he can't. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. He accomplished this great feat, but he can't tell anyone about it. And I don't know, maybe that explains why Samson couldn't talk about defeating the lion. He was someplace where he shouldn't have been. But there's something else going on here that isn't right. Because when Samson kills the lion and he tears it from limb to limb, he's again violating his Nazarite vow in another way. Numbers chapter 6 also specifies that a Nazarite could not even touch a dead body. And in handling this lion's corpse, Samson was, you know, going to now become ceremonially unclean. He was going to be defiled before God. So it's no wonder he keeps quiet about this, this amazing feat with this lion. Now, do you ever notice that uh, once the door has been opened to a particular sin, it's a lot easier to open that door to the sin the next time? you ever notice that? In Judges chapter 14, verse 8, we read, Sometime later, when he went back to marry her, he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass, and it was a swarm of, and it was a swarm of bees and some honey. So, this is kind of interesting. If the first encounter with the lion was an accident, in spite of the fact that he was where he shouldn't have been to begin with, the second encounter with the lion was Samson's own intentional poor choice. This was his choice to sin. Samson was intrigued by this lion that he killed with his bare hands. He's curious about, you know, what happened to the carcass. He's just going to take a look, right? But sin is often alluring like that. We're curious. We're intrigued. Just a little look, just a little taste, just a little touch, just this one time, just this one more time. That's how sin works, and before we know it, sin consumes us, and we can't hardly stop thinking about it. The co-worker who's married, the neighbor, the, the website, the delicious taste of the food, you know, the, the procrastination, the laziness, the money, the high. And Samson, he contemplated his options, and he went out of his way to search for something that was forbidden to him. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it tells us that our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. 
temptation and sin are that way. I think that's why Peter says to be alert and self-controlled. Samson was anything but self-controlled and alert here, which explains why maybe he didn't talk about it with anyone. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, we read how each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. And so we see that Samson had some secret sins that eventually caught up to him. But another observation is this. Samson hid his sin rather than address it. We saw this in verse 6 where the Bible tells us Samson overcame this lion single-handedly, right? He didn't tell his father or mother what he had done. Then again, Samson hides his sin because something similar happens again in verse 9. This time, Samson is traveling alone, and he stops by the vineyard to revisit this place where he did had this great exploit, right? And he finds the bees have built a honeycomb inside of this dried-out carcass of a lion. And then in Judges 14, verse 9, we read, He scooped out the honey, and with his hands he ate as he went along. Then he rejoined his parents, he gave them some, and they ate too. But he didn't tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. What, what is up with that? I think what's up with that is by doing this, Samson causes his parents to participate in this sin. Because this honey, which came from the lion's carcass, it would also make them spiritually unclean as well. He is not forthcoming about where he came by this honey. And sin has this this tendency to spread from one person to another, doesn't it? If we're involved with sin, we tend to get others involved in the sin with us. Or maybe sin impacts us even if we're innocent. You know, a drunken driver who smashes into a carload of people, he may be the one who owns the sin, right? The people who got smashed into, they didn't do anything wrong, and yet that sin impacts their lives. Or family, you know, a husband and wife, they, they get divorced and that sin is theirs, it's on them, but it still impacts their kids, doesn't it? It still impacts the, the, their extended families, it still impacts their friends. Now maybe for you, the reason why you're not open and truthful is because maybe you just want to avoid some awkward conversations, or maybe you want to avoid some awkward situations. And so you say, oh, I love your dress when you really don't. <laughs> or you say, oh, you're such a good cook, when really you feed the cooking to the dog, right? Or maybe you say, I love the purple basket weaving craft you gave me for my birthday, when you know it's going right into the closet until your next garage sale where you're gonna sell that thing. Well, sometimes that's why we are less than open and forthcoming, but sometimes, not being open and truthful is more serious. Maybe you're keeping secrets from a loved one. You know, maybe they don't know how much you're actually spending on the credit card. Or maybe you're, maybe you're lying to yourself to make yourself feel better. And you say, you know what? Padding my expensive report really isn't a big deal because my company can afford it. I'm not kidding you. Just yesterday in the Lansing State Journal, I read about a government official who was fired and, and now under investigation for padding his expense account. Thousands and thousands of dollars. Or maybe you're just plain lying to yourself because you don't want to face your own shortcomings, you know? I'm not really all that overweight. <laughs> but it's important for us to stop kidding ourselves. Our sins in secret matter. And the Bible tells us that fearing the Lord and walking in His ways is the foundation for true happiness. We sometimes think that our sin is going to make us happy. Really, our sin just makes us guilty. But in Psalm 128, verses 1 through 4, we read, Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who walk in His ways. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. He says, Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your sons will be like olive shoots around your table. Thus is the man blessed who fears the Lord. Nothing feels better than knowing you are doing the right thing. When you do the right thing, you can live your life openly instead of in secrecy and with conniving. And Samson at this point is the picture of a believer who's going farther and farther away from God. It's like you start out innocently enough, you know, testing the water, carefully wandering where you don't belong, maybe then casually going your own way, following your emotions to see where they'll lead you, oblivious to, you know, those who would warn you of the, of the danger that's ahead. And eventually, 
your spiritual commitments don't mean much to you anymore. You end up like Samson, who, while he looks spiritual on the outside, you know, he had that long, flowing hair. <laughs> but on the inside, he was really carnal and quite world. That will help prevent us from drifting away from God because truth and integrity have gone missing from our life. What can we do about that? Let's consider some practical ways we can live in honesty and truth. First, stay away from temptation as much as it depends on you. You have to guard your heart. Because I'm telling you, few people I know start out wanting to throw away everything that's important to them. And we tell ourselves, you know, I, I can handle it. I won't, I, I won't give in. But temptation is a slippery slope. And I don't know if you've ever been on a slippery hillside before. You know, maybe at first you can get some traction, but eventually you keep sliding down. You get to that point where phew, you are gone. And sin will work like that in our lives. The best and most effective way to foil compromising situations is to avoid playing around with temptation altogether. Get intentionally honest with yourself. Figure out where your tendencies to be tempted lie. In James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, we read, Each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. And then after his desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So what are your evil desires? Get honest with yourself. If overspending is your desire, then don't go shopping by yourself. If you don't want to lust, then quit looking. If the doctor tells you you need to lose weight for the sake of your health, then stop going to the buffet at lunchtime and stop eating at night in front of the TV. If you don't want, if you want to stop drinking, then don't drop by the bar to check in and see how your buddies are doing. If you don't want to end up crossing a line with your date, then don't lie down on the couch or the bed together. You see, we all have weaknesses that subtly draw us into these destructive patterns of sin. And the counsel that Paul gave to young people about this subject is not just limited to young people, believe me. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, he says, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So you have to get very intentional about developing a strong, godly spiritual life. And here's the thing, when temptation comes upon you, look for a way out as quickly as possible. Again, some godly counsel from the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide you with a way out so that you can stand up under it. And the question is, are you looking for a way out? You have to do more than just wish, oh, I, I wish I wasn't tempted so much. Uh, you know, you have to get away from that temptation as much as it depends on you. A second practical way to live honestly in the truth is to go with friends on the Christian journey who accept Christ's truth and who will help you live faithfully. When you isolate yourself from people, it just serves to aid secret sins. It, it just does. There is something about the way God created us where we need other people around us. When we go off by ourselves, we tend to not do so well. And even though we read in Judges 14, verses 10 and 11, that Samson had 30 companions with him when his wedding feast was underway, these men were neither his friends, nor did they really care about him, nor were they godly. They were men who were hired to protect the wedding party from marauding bands who would rob them and try to steal their stuff while they were partying. But we know these men were not friends because later in verse 15, it says that these 30 companions were Philistines and they later sought to harm Samson. So here's the thing. We're not just talking about having anyone for a friend. We're talking about having friends who accept God's truth and who will help you to live faithfully. Nowhere in Samson's story do we read that he had a close friend like this who loved God's truth and who helped him along in his journey of faith. In fact, as a loner, he makes a lot of poor decisions, a lot of sinful decisions. If you want to get a leg up on the devil, then you need to have authentic, God-honoring, trustworthy, call you out when you do wrong friends. Here's what Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 says. 
Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, and a cord of three strands is not easily broken. And I love Proverbs 27, 17. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another. There's a lot of truth there. Are friends important? Tom Sawyer had Huck Finn. Gilligan had, <laughs> had Skipper and Forrest had Bubba, right? In the Bible, Moses had Joshua, Ruth had Naomi, David had Jonathan, Elijah had Elisha, Paul had Barnabas, even Jesus himself had close friends. Do you know who his three closest friends were? Peter, James, and John. They're the ones mentioned going with him. They were like his inner circle. These are the people who inspire us towards godliness. Let me give you just one more very practical word of counsel for living honestly and openly and in the truth. And that is, tell your sins and, and your struggles and your secrets to Christ daily. Nothing helps develop integrity in your life like staying open and honest with God and keeping your list of unconfessed sins short. You know what I'm saying? Samson, he kept his long list of, of sins, and it was a secret sins. And secret sin has a way of growing more and more powerful in your life if you're not careful. It, it just becomes more complicated and harder to escape it the longer it goes on. And, and like a, a spider that wraps its web around a fly, sin will eventually consume you, and it will overtake you. Unless you are intentional and conscious about cleansing your soul through confession on a daily basis. And it's not that we confess our sins for God's sake as if he wouldn't know what we were doing otherwise. God knows about our secret sins. Psalm 90, verse 8, it says, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. So God knows what you've done. But the reason why you need to confess your sins is because it is for our own sake. Okay? And a guy who knew a thing or two about secret sins and their consequences was King David. He committed adultery, and then he tried to cover that up by plotting a, a murder, you know, and, and this unintended pregnancy. But God knew what he had done, and God sent the prophet Nathan to confront David. And here's the thing. When David confessed his sin, then a powerful healing began to take place. Here's what we read, Psalm 32, verses 3 through 5. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Samson is the picture of a believer who is out of control because truth and integrity were missing from his life. And, and here's the irony. He was empowered by the Spirit, but he was never controlled by the Spirit. And that can happen to any of us. And when it does, just like Samson, we will be capable of great accomplishments, but we will also be capable of incredibly stupid mistakes at the same time. And the good news is, if we're honest with ourselves, we can find forgiveness and healing from Jesus, and it will bring freedom into your life. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, it says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So if you want to be set free from the shackles of secret sin, then you need to tell your secrets to Christ on a daily basis. In the Gospel of John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus said that when you know the truth, the truth will set you free, and the truth will make you free. But you know what? It often hurts first. I think this explains why so many people have trouble growing spiritually. It's not because we don't know the truth. We've got so much truth, it's just kind of running out of our ears. We hear the, church at, uh, we hear the truth at church. We hear the truth from the Bible. We hear the truth on the radio, from our friends, from DVDs, you know, and different books we read. The problem isn't that we don't know the truth. The problem is we don't allow the truth to hurt us. In other words, we don't 
want the truth to convict us, and so we don't let it convict us. We don't want it to inconvenience us, and so we never let the truth inconvenience us. We don't want the truth to keep us from getting what we want. And so we deflect it, we ignore it, we deny it, we argue against it, we attack it. In general, we avoid the truth in any way that we possibly can. It's kind of like, uh, I like, anybody here like Star Trek? It's kind of like when you're being like the, the Starship Enterprise, right? It's under enemy attack by the Klingons. What do they do? They put up that force field so that it deflects the rays from coming upon the ship. And I think sometimes when it comes to God's truth, we're just like that. We hear the truth, we know the truth, but we deflect it and its words never get into our, our heart. It's, it's, it's truth never comes into our, our words and our actions. And so no wonder our hearts are never free. I think that's why we're still angry and we're still stubborn and we're still bitter and we're still greedy and we're still arrogant and we're still filled with lust and we're still self-centered and we're still unkind. We refuse to allow God's truth in. We refuse to let it hurt us and then heal us. Well, Samson thought he was free, but he wasn't. He was in bondage to his own secret sins and his lack of integrity. And strangely enough, the truly free person isn't the one who gets to do whatever they want. The truly free person is the one who's dared to let the grace of Christ and the truth of God sink into their heart so that integrity and honesty can become central in our life. That's when you are truly set free. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the lessons that we learn from Samson. And sometimes the truth does hurt. Um, but God, we know that your truth ultimately brings healing and happiness. And it is the foundation on which we need to build our lives. And so I just lift up each person here in this room this morning that you will help us in this task of building integrity and honesty into our lives, that it might show forth in the words we speak and in the actions we do, that we might be honest and open in your sight, that we would be men and women who are in private what we look to be in public. God, help us to honor you in every single way. And may your favor and blessing go with us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.